is Sandra Herndon. I'm president of the League of Women Voters, and I am delighted to welcome you here this evening. How many of you here tonight have been at all of the other events? Stand up and be anointed. Okay. Excellent. All right. How many of you have been, this is number four, how many of you have been at two? This is number four. Okay, very good. All right. How many of you have been in at least one? Okay, very good, very good. All right. Pass the word along. This is a very good event, and we have one more coming on May the 7th for those of you with stamina. Okay, May the 7th. And we'll be talking about very important topics like salmon and orca. So that will be very important for you to come to. So we're happy to have you here. Uh, in my official capacity here, it's my job to tell you a little bit about the League of Women Voters in case you don't already know. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, very political. I uh, you know that sounds like a contradiction. We are nonpartisan. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties, although sometimes it's difficult. We do our very best, but in terms of issues, we are very partisan. And we're in favor of water. And we're having all these programs on water because if we didn't have water, we wouldn't be here today or tomorrow. So that is, water is not really a partisan issue, but we are in favor of whatever it takes to have clean, potable water, and plenty of it. Okay. So the study group that's been putting these programs on, will all of you involved in the study group please stand? Raise your hands and wave them about. All right. This is a serious group doing a serious work, and after this year's programs, they have another year of work where they have to put this all together and create a report and do something with it. So they're not done just because these public programs are over. So please know that the water study will continue and their work has been extremely important. You'll also notice uh, uh, all around us are various uh, poster boards with important topics. Uh, a special shout out to Esther Cronenberg and the wonderful thing she's done with the Vibrant County posters. You've seen them all about, and they're here on a number of these poster boards, highlighting individuals who are speaking on behalf of important topics having to do with the environment in Thurston County. So it's um, Take your time and look at these things before you leave. Um, so thank you all for coming. And um, I think that's all I need to say tonight before I turn this over to the main person here, which is Karen. You're not the main person. I'm just the moderator. Are you the, well, that's the main person. So is there someone standing behind me who, oh, oh yes, Carol is standing behind you. Or in front of me, and to, I'm going to say the right words. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Let, let's manage some expectations here tonight. <laughs> I'm so tickled to be here. And for those of you that have uh, been at our water meetings, just bear with me. And those of you that are new, let me just point out a couple of logistics. One is that uh, if you have not signed in, we are going to ask that you sign in. We promise we will not call you at dinner time, nor will we sell your data. Um, if you want to know where the water is, you want to know where the bathrooms are, they're just down the hall and around the corner. Uh, we do ask that you turn your phone either off or on vibrate, which would be lovely. Um, and we will be having a five minute break after the four presentations just to give you a little stretch of the legs before we start in on, on questioning. Um, and then there's also, you picked up your agenda. This here. And so you see what, what 
um, what, how we're handling this evening and who, who the panelists are. And then on the back, uh, we want to make sure that as we discuss water and all of the parts and pieces that go together, that you can follow along the conversation. There's a glossary of terms on the back of acronyms and the alphabet soup of managing water. What's runoff? Quick, tell me, quick. Um, and then also, if you have some topics that you would like to see in the, in the next year that the League would put on, please do write it down and you can give us this back at the end. I uh, also want to mention that there's, there will be no water testing, but there is water in the back of the room with a, some, a little snacks. And then also, uh, if you could take a moment and help us stack chairs before we go home tonight. Many hands make lighter work for us all, so thank you for that. It is indeed my honor and pleasure to introduce Karen Frazier. And what I can say about Karen is that she's been in the Washington State House of Representatives and, and also served in the Senate together 28 years. And she's only 25. <laughs> Karen, you look dang good, let me just say. <laughs> but when I look at, at the um, awards and the different leadership uh, recognition opportunities that Karen's been part of, what I keep coming back to, Karen, is that you continue to work with the people and you have helped to pass legislation to people that really matter. So we're so happy to have you. So everyone, Karen Frazier. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Karen Fraser, and I'm the moderator for this evening. And it's a delight to see so many interested people here and find out that many of you are return, returnees to our forums. Uh, so uh, welcome again on behalf of the Water Committee. We, we have a great group. and. We, saw who they are. I'd like to give a special shout out to Paula Holroyd. Can you stand up in the front row? <laughs> Paula is the impresario of all of this and she keeps us all organized and moving ahead. So thank you Paula. And thank every member of the committee. So the goals of these forums are to improve public awareness about water resources in the area and to stimulate informed public discussion. <laughs> So, and as, as Sandra mentioned, uh, this is part of the League of Women Voters, um, you might say, research effort to update its water study from about 10 or 11 years ago. So, we'll be coming out of that in a year or so. So, uh, and I'd like to also say we appreciate the, the coverage, nice coverage of uh, these forums by the Olympian and also wonderful coverage in the Squally Valley Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Downing, uh, Port of Olympia Commissioner. Thank you. Chris Stearns, PUD Commissioner, District 3. Okay, thank you. Well, appreciate you both. Thank you. Oh, wait, more. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, if you have important roles. And our, our theme tonight is stormwater, so that's what we'll, we'll be focusing on. Um, as you know, our, our, our series is entitled, Where's the Water Adopt Adapted from the Olympia Brewery's uh, slogan of It's the Water, and which kind of implies we have unlimited good quality of water. And uh, so the question we are posing to ourselves uh, with, with these forums is, is that still the case? And so we're ho hopefully slowly learning more about our water resources in the area. So some interesting facts about water. Uh, those of you who've been here, the prior ones, you've, you've heard this, but there's a finite amount of water on the earth. There's no new water. It can shoot forms between ice and rain and salt and fresh. But when you boil it all down, there's really only about 1% of the water in the world is fresh 
and available uh, to human beings to use. So we, that's why we have such big arguments over <laughs> what should, how should we use our water because it's very precious and we have a lot of uses we want to make of it, including uh, environmental protection, which is important to human life. So we all must recognize that fresh water is precious and we must manage it with knowledge and care. So we've had several forms, so let me just give you a quick squib on uh, what, what we learned from our uh, prior presenters to kind of move us into talking about stormwater tonight. Uh, first, Kevin Hansen, Christian County hydrogeologist, talked about, had a lot of good diagrams and charts showing us that most of the water in Christian County is groundwater and flows in through the ground into lakes and streams and ultimately into Puget Sound. And there are a lot of water short areas in the county. In fact, the whole county is, is uh, challenged with regard to water. So the need for careful management is increasing. We had David Trapp, biologist, director of the Natural Resources Department of the Wally Tribe. He, he had some interesting uh, slides showing that the, the I-5 across the delta is acting as a two-way dam for the water coming down the river and then the the salt water coming into the delta, so it's interfering with adequate mixing for uh, juvenile fish. Uh, then we had Director of Ecology, <coughs> Maya Bellin, who talked about the major new water laws and uh, how they need to involve local governments more than in the past due to the Supreme Court interpretation called the Hearst decision. And with these new laws, the uh, the legislature identified two watersheds for early action. One of them was in Squally, and they got their plan done on, on time, uh, and uh, she was very complimentary of, of their work. And we had George Walter, environmental program supervisor within the Squally tribe, and he was right in the middle of doing this early action with the Squally, and he talked about how they managed to get it done well and on time. And a big part of it was the history of having an ongoing watershed council of the watershed plan and uh, good communications up and down the river where people know each other and know the resource. It makes a big difference. And then we had Mark Daly, executive director of the Thurston Regional Planning Council, talked about uh, the Thurston County Sustainability Plan and a lot of suggestions for water conservation. We had, uh, we went down to Yelm and Mayor Foster of Yelm talked about the geological history of, of the Nisqually Basin, which affects our lives and the importance of achieving a healthy balance between human needs and natural resources needs uh, in the river, in the river systems. Glenn Shorno from a major agricultural operation in the Yelm area talked about various ways that agriculture uses water and a lot of the more contemporary strategies for conserving water in the agricultural sector. And Nora White with the Thurston County Conservation District spoke about the services and funding the district makes available to landowners on a voluntary basis to improve water conservation and habitat protection. So that's uh, kind of how we got here tonight. And now tonight we're, we're going to talk about stormwater. So once in a while it rains enough that there's a little water that runs off. <laughs> so we need to know more about that. And we have a talented group of professionals here to provide information and insights. And we're, we want to do a little different format for our meeting tonight. So we've uh, we prepared a general list of questions relating to stormwater that we've given to each of the panelists. And I believe you each have a copy. And so we're asking each one to take 12, 15 minutes to talk about, to respond to those questions, the ones that are most relevant to their particular responsibilities. And then we'll ask uh, panelists if you want to comment or ask questions of each other. And uh, they'll take a break. And then we'll have, uh, all of you can ask questions. And we're looking forward to it. And if you find one on the list that you didn't think was adequately covered, please, please ask. So, uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to, let's, let's begin. So begin the begin here, begin with our stormwater conversation. So I'd like to first introduce Abby Stockwell, 
She is the Watershed Resources Unit Supervisor with the Water Quality Program of the Department of Ecology. So, Abby, thank you for being here. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Um, so I'm Abby Sokol. I'm not a unit supervisor. I'm actually the municipal, um, I'm a municipal stormwater planner. And um, I am the team lead for the municipal stormwater team that Ecology has. Um, and the phase two municipal stormwater permit writer for the state. So that's my background. Um, you'll hear a lot about the municipal stormwater permit tonight because I love to talk about it. Um, and it's hard to talk about it in 15 minutes, so I'm going to go try and cover a lot of it, a lot of stuff fast, and then you guys can ask me questions later. So let's get going. And so as we all know, I think in this room, stormwater is natural occurrence, right? But it's become a problem because of how we use the land every day. We've covered up these beautiful soils with impervious surfaces, so now we have more stormwater running off the land faster than it did before. And then we also drop trash and drive on it and drop heavy metals, um, lead, copper, zinc, and fertilizers, which mixes with the stormwater. And all of that is creating the problems that we know today that are happening in our receiving waters. So we have this problem, what are we doing about it? Well at Ecology we have a few tools in our toolbox. And um, one of the more powerful tools that I'll talk about tonight are the Clean Water Act permits. Um, what some of you may have heard called the MPDES permit, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, um, which is, comes from the Clean Water Act. And, but we also have other tools that we use. We have cleanup programs that are trying to get rid of or cover up or clean up the old contaminated sites that are um, adding contaminants to our receiving water. We have source control programs that are looking at um, generators of hazardous waste and keeping, trying to keep that hazardous waste out of our water streams before it even causes a problem. We also do um, a bit of technical assistance and education outreach to make um, people, operators of non-regulated stormwater aware of how they can implement best management practices. And then we're very fortunate in Washington State that we have a significant amount of money to put towards grants and loans that are used for specific stormwater projects. Um, all again to improve the stormwater before it hits the receiving water. So, um, so um, going back to those for our permitting tools. Um, the municipal stormwater permit, the one that I love, uh, regulates the public stormwater systems. So these are what the cities or the counties own and operate the curbs and the pipes, the streets, um, ditches that convey stormwater to a receiving water. So that's what the municipal stormwater permit regulates, is the public stormwater system. But there are other um, stormwater permits that are regulating stormwater discharges from a particular site. So we have a construction general permit, which is regulating um, large construction sites and making sure that the stormwater leaving that site is clean. And then we have industrial general permits, which is regulating the stormwater off of industrial facility sites. And then we also have um, a UIC underground injection control program, which is, um, it overlaps with the stormwater permits from the Clean Water Act, but it actually comes um, from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So the UICs, these underground injection control wells, are another way to manage stormwater, but they're not regulated through the municipal stormwater permit. So the municipal separate storm sewer system, it's different from those systems you see or have heard about in Seattle or Tacoma because it's, these are pipes or conveyances just carrying stormwater. It's not mixing with your sewage pipes that you see in those bigger cities. And in Washington State, this is what the municipal stormwater permit looks like. We, um, when the EPA released their stormwater rules through the Clean Water Act, it came out in two waves. So that's why you hear about a phase one municipal stormwater permit. Those came out first. They targeted the most populated areas. And so that, applied, and the, that permit was first issued in 95, and it applies to the um, cities of Seattle and Tacoma, um, and then the larger counties, King, Snohomish, Pierce, Clark, and Clark. 
And then in the late 90s, the EPA released their second phase of stormwater rules, so phase two. And um, that is, those rules targeted the smaller urbanized areas. And so we in Washington issued our first phase two permit in 2007. And we have two phase two permits. We have one for Western Washington, and we have another one for Eastern Washington. And we have two because of the, just the different climates, different um, conditions in each side of the state. And I can't forget to mention WashDOT has a municipal stormwater permit too. And that WashDOT permit only applies to, to WashDOT. And what is different about the municipal stormwater permit is that it doesn't um, assign like a, a number that you have to, that your stormwater has to meet for specific water quality parameters at the end of the pipe. It asks cities and counties to develop programs um, to implement that work to improve stormwater conditions. So cities and counties need to implement a public education outreach program. They're required to do proper operation and maintenance of their stormwater infrastructure. Um, they're also required to have ordinances which prohibit non-stormwater from getting into their stormwater system. And there's more too, but I can talk about that later. Have to be fast. So here's what um, the map of permit coverage looks like in western Washington. As you can see, it doesn't cover all of the areas. These um, permits are focused on the urbanized areas. So the blue areas you see are the phase one permit coverage areas. And so phase one covers all of the county, but phase two only covers the urbanized areas, and that is the red areas. And so for a phase two city, it's gonna cover all of the city that has an MS4. Um, but for a phase two county, it's only going to cover the urbanized areas um, that are defined by the census, as well as the urban growth areas according to the um, Growth Management Act. So, um, the permits are on their, well the third phase, phase one permit cycle, we issue these permits about every five years. And um, the phase two permits are on their second permit cycle. And we've learned a lot um, from implementing these permits. I say we as ecology, but it's really the cities and counties that are doing the hard work. And we've learned a lot from them. Um, and one of the sort of novel approaches that was taken through this 2013 permit is a regional stormwater um, monitoring program. It's now called SAM, um, Stormwater Action Monitoring. But the permittees have pooled their money together to develop a regional um, monitoring program to get a better understanding of how well these practices are working and what is the um, conditions of the receiving water. Are things getting better or worse? So there's three programs to SAM. And, um, <clears throat> It's one of the effectiveness studies program, which is again looking at how effective are either the best management practices that are being installed um, or certain activities that are um, taking place in the cities and counties. Um, then there's a source identification program, which is looking at all of the information where things of non-stormwater are getting into your stormwater system that the cities and counties have to react to. And we're trying to analyze that information to determine if there are common sources or any sort of trends where we can focus our attention to to make that program more efficient. And then there's the receiving water monitoring um, side of this program, which is trying to assess whether conditions are getting better or worse based on the actions we're taking on the land. Um, yes. So for the streams um, monitoring program, Again, this is, an, this is a regional monitoring approach. So it's, look, it looked at 100 sites over the, over the Puget Sound region. And it took samples um, in 2015. So we don't have any trends yet, but we're trying to get the baseline. And we um, monitored for water chemistry and sediment. And what we found is that the biological status or the condition um, was based on comparison to data from the least disturbed reference sites. So these are not water quality standards. These are reference sites have generally very good water conditions. And what we found is that um, BIBI stands for benthic index of biotic integrity based on benthic, <laughs> based on benthic and very favorite data. So it's like the bugs in the stream. They're studying the bugs in the stream. And what they found is that when you leave those urban growth areas, 
the conditions in the stream are generally better. So when you're in the urbanized areas, the conditions in the streams are generally worse. And that's what those, these monitoring results found us. And it's basically what we knew. When we looked at the water quality um, uh, information that we got compared to the water quality standards, we found that within these urban growth areas, there was a higher frequency of exceedance for fecal coliform or bacteria. But for temperature, pH, and dissolved ox oxygen, there was no difference whether you were inside or outside those urban growth areas um, as far as frequency of exceedances. And then they typically found no exceedance of metals um, uh, for either inside or outside. The, those urban growth areas, except on two occurrences, and one notably was in the Deschutes River. So this was a one-time occurrence um, in February 2015 where the water quality standards were exceeded for both acute and chronic. Um, for cadmium, copper, and zinc. And then the chronic was exceeded in the, for lead as well. Um, we also looked at our data compared to sediment water, sediment standards, sediment quality standards. And we found that the um, contaminant concentrations did not typically exceed sediment quality standards, whether you're inside or outside the um, urban growth areas. So um, what have we learned so far with our stream studies? Um, when it comes to the bugs, the stressors um, are primarily related to habitat. And notice there's very few toxics listed here. So it's really about um, stream, the fine sediments, and smothering, and some nutrients getting in the, um, this, this receiving waters. But canopy was the single most important stressor uh, to the biotic endpoint. So canopy, or forests, they provide flow control, filtration, and habitat, and these factors are impacting the health of the stream more than toxic compounds at the regional scale. So it's all about the trees. Like, about the trees. It's not that simple, right? But I like to put a plug in for trees. So um, we also keep hearing about urban runoff mortality syndrome. This was used to be called um, pre-spawn pre -spawn, pre -spawn mortality. Um, and so it's a new name for this phenomenon we've been seeing for a while, uh, where stormwater untreated is killing adult um, salmon as they're coming into the rivers to spawn. And so we're continuing, ecology is continuing to study this, the Stormwater Center and NOAA as well. Um, and they've been honing in on what are these chemicals that are causing this um, die-off to occur. And they're starting to think it might be chemicals associated with tires um, that appears to be the worst culprit causing the toxicity to the salmon. Um, but again, it's something that's still being studied and researched and we hope to get more information as, time, as these studies progress. Um, but what we've learned is that when we treat the stormwater before it hits the receiving waters and the, um, where the salmon are, it, it's no longer toxic to salmon. So just using bioretention, which is an engineered green stormwater PMP where you're using um, a design, um, but engineered soils and, and planting, you can um, really effectively treat the stormwater not only for um, metals like copper and zinc, but also you can treat the flow you can treat the flow as well, so slowing the stormwater down before it leaves your site. And the municipal stormwater permits have um, are requiring these, this movement towards more green infrastructure or low impact development. And so you'll start seeing changes in your neighborhoods, in your um, cities where new projects, redevelopment projects are going to start employing more green um, BMPs rather than just your gray um, hardscapes. Um, <clears throat> but I can't just talk about what the great things the permit does. There's also some limitations to the authority of these municipal stormwater permits. They prim primarily focused on new and redevelopment projects, and we know that we have a legacy of existing development that's gone on um, for decades without any stormwater controls. And so the stormwater permits have a an edge at addressing existing development, but that is a massive issue, concern out there, is how do we address the runoff from the existing development. And our municipal stormwater permits are a general 
a general permit, they apply to um, the cities and counties um, broadly, and the requirements are uh, to be applied wherever they're required to be applied, right? So we don't target specific areas that are really important to each ecological life. Um, but we are trying to address that with the reissuance of the next permit, which will is coming this summer. And how we're trying to get at that is um, the permit isn't final yet. We, in the formal draft, which we put out this summer for comment, we propose requiring that cities and counties um, do stormwater planning. So looking at their receiving water and determining what are some stormwater best management practices that we can apply specifically to this watershed that should imp um, impact positively the receiving waters. Um, we have also are now requiring the phase one permittees, those bigger cities and counties, to actually start building um, stormwater projects to address existing development. And then um, in the phase two permit, we're adding a source, or we're proposing to add a source control um, program for existing development. This is a program that's been in the phase one permit, but it's um, intended to go to those businesses or existing properties that may have, that have the potential to pollute and um, making sure that they have the proper BMPs in place to make sure that those pollutants aren't leaving their site. So um, as I showed you earlier, that the permits don't cover the entire state. They're limited in where they cover. So not everywhere has stormwater controls being applied to new and redevelopment projects. Um, Non-point sources are all over cities and counties and those aren't regulated through their municipal stormwater permit. Um, and then there's also um, unregulated uh, outfalls. So there's private outfalls or there are outfalls that aren't connected to those public stormwater systems that aren't being regulated by the state, um, but may be regulated in different ways. So there's more that ecology does through, than just the permits. Um, we provide financial assistance, technical assistance, um, training programs uh, as well. And we find a number of um, other activities that are useful for stormwater management, such as the stormwater center that is doing research. Okay. And um, so finally, my, my closing, what else is needed? We have, um, we need a dedicated stormwater funding. We have, we get a, a, um, money from the legislature, but we need a sustainable um, funds. And I think um, what this, um, the public can do is actively support your local programs. Um, for, with the cities and counties and show your support and talk to your elected officials and let them know that stormwater is a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. You covered a lot in a short time and we appreciate giving a great overview. Thank you. So uh, next I'd like to introduce Jana Ratcliffe. Uh, she's also with Department of Ecology. She's the program manager for stormwater and watersheds. Thank you for being here. And I am actually with DOT. I am not with the department, but that's okay. We extra appreciate. Yes. Well, actually, Abby did a great lead-in for me, so um, she covered a lot of the stuff that is kind of necessary to talk about the things that I was hoping to talk about in just 15 minutes. So thank you for. Um, I equally love the municipal permit, so and spend almost every day working on it. So. So I guess first off, I'd just like to say thank you all for having me here to talk about stormwater and what Washdot is doing to uh, address it. I've been at the Washington State Department of Transportation for about 15 years in the stormwater program the entire time. So I went from kind of the lowest level person there to now running the branch that deals with stormwater. So I've seen a lot of the different things that we do and how it affects projects and writing policy and trying to help um, help people out in the field that are out on our construction sites and on a project figure out how to implement this complicated permit that we have and complicated water quality issues in general. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, Abby did a great job kind of leading in here. She touched on the fact that 
Uh, there's a lot of existing impervious surfaces out there that were built prior to the Clean Water Act and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits. And from a public safety perspective, WashDOT has been in the mode of getting the water off the road as quickly as possible. Uh, you can't have water or else people are going to hydroplane and crash. So, uh, however, we know that this approach is not protective of the environment. And while we were making efforts to address stormwater um, in the mid-90s and prior to that, uh, a lot has changed since our first NPDES municipal permit was issued in 1995. So, Abby mentioned phase ones. Uh, permits came out in 1995 and WashDOT was um, part of that, big municipalities. Um, the permit was reissued in 2009, again in 2014, and then just again last month. So um, we've had several of these permits and each time it morphs a little bit and changes a little bit. Um, the biggest change was in 2009. There was a very large increase in requirements and um, monitoring, mapping, maintenance for the big, we call them the 3Ms, because those are, the, those are the big ones for us. So on this uh, slide, I just have kind of a general overview of the permit requirements, and I'm going to talk in more detail about some of those, and some of them I'm probably not going to get to at all. But our municipal permit covers ongoing operational stormwater discharges from our highways, rest areas, park and ride lots, ferry terminals, and maintenance facilities in those urban areas that Abby was talking about earlier, and they're shown in orange on the map. So the permit applies across the state in those orange areas. So in addition to implementing the permit and all those requirements in those orange areas on that map, we also manage stormwater and try to improve water quality statewide. To do that, we are implementing our stormwater design standards across the state through an implementing agreement with Department of Ecology. So the permit only applies in those orange areas, but we've made an agreement with Department of Ecology that we would implement our highway runoff manual, which is our design guidance document for stormwater, we implement that statewide. It doesn't matter if you're in those urban areas or not. We also obtain and implement construction stormwater general permits every time we have a project that it's exceeds one acre of soil disturbance or more. We design new bridges to convey runoff to the embankments rather than just directly discharging as they did in the past. We either make the shoulders wide enough on the bridge so that water can flow down the side of the bridge safely off the traveled lanes, off to the side of the bridge where it can run through vegetation, hopefully, um, and discharge. Or we'll attach uh, pipes and catch basins and things to route the water off the bridge, but we're no longer designing those to just directly discharge. We also implement stormwater treatment on projects when we exceed um, 500 square feet or more of impervious surface or pavement uh, when there are threatened or endangered species present. So we're doing a lot of stuff statewide even outside of those permit coverage areas. So one of the requirements of the permit, like I said, that we do statewide is that we um, build stormwater control devices, best management practices, those terms are kind of used interchangeably here. We build things to treat and control flow when we build new roadways or when we redevelop projects. So if a project adds a certain amount of new pavement, and that's defined in our highway runoff manual, then they're required to build some sort of a facility, whether it's a bioswale or a stormwater pond, something to um, treat that water or control the flow of that water before it discharges. And then we also um, have a program for retrofitting those existing pavements. And that program is a little bit complicated, but it's broken up into three main pieces. 
we've got project triggered retrofits. And in the Puget Sound Basin, if there's a project that triggers the need to build a new device for the new pavement, they also have to treat some of the existing pavement. Um, it's a little bit different outside of the Puget Sound Basin. It's not as stringent. I won't really go into that. Um, the other category of retrofit is opportunity-based. And this is where a project elects to do more. To, to build a device or to take more runoff off the roadway because maybe it's just flowing that way anyway and it's easier to just catch it all and treat it all um, even though they may not be required to do that. And then we also have a standalone stormwater retrofit which uh, those are projects that are initiated to specifically build a treatment facility at a location um, because it has ranked high or medium in our prioritization process, which I'm going to talk about next. So the prioritization process was developed with state and federal resource agencies about 10 years ago. And the goal was to help WatchDOT figure out where to invest our retrofit money um, in order to get the highest env environmental benefit uh, relative to cost, and that ended up mostly focusing on the urban fringe area. So lower cost, right of way, um, watersheds aren't as impacted by development. Um, you have a chance to restore the stream. So that's where our prioritization is focused. And I actually have a handout up here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that prioritization process and everything that goes into it and how we wait every segment and how we end up with this map. Please feel free to come up and take one. So in addition to building treatment facilities and retrofitting, we do stormwater monitoring. Our initial permit required monitoring studies were to characterize the water quality coming off of our facilities. And when I say facilities, we had an option to select our maintenance facilities, ferry terminals, or I think park and ride lots or rest areas, one, one or the other. So we ended up selecting um, a maintenance facility in Spokane, a maintenance facility in Lakewood, maintenance facility in Wenatchee, maintenance facility in Vancouver, one in Shoreline, the Smoky Point rest areas, northbound and southbound, and then the Bainbridge Ferry <coughs> Terminal. So seven locations um, across the state we needed to take samples and um, essentially define a baseline, characterize the runoff coming off of that facility. We also did the same with highway sites. So we had to pick five locations based on um, where they were in the state and how many cars traveled on that roadway per day. We ended up selecting an, a site up by Everett on I-5, so really high uh, average daily traffic, a location on I-5 near Pilchuck Creek, location on SR-9, a facility or a highway out on uh, I-90 in Spokane, and again, we were characterizing the stormwater coming off of the, that highway in that area. So those studies were under our uh, 2009 permit, and they wrapped up as you can see, um, our final report for the facility monitoring was done in 2014, and our highway characterization report was done in 2015. And since that time, our permit now requires monitoring studies that are more focused on effectiveness. So how are the things that we're doing actually working at improving water quality? So we've got, 
um, highway BMP effectiveness study that we are wrapping up right now. We have a final report that is uh, going through internal review. It will soon be submitted to the Department of Ecology. And it is looking at the effectiveness of a vegetated filter strip, which is essentially a roadway embankment with vegetation, um, which is a actual best management practice in our highway runoff manual. It removes basic uh, pollutants, which is 80% of total suspended solids. And it compares it to a modified vegetated filter strip, which has a three inch thick layer of compost on top of it. So we wanted to show how much better that compost does at uh, removing pollutants on that section of embankment. As I mentioned, that study is wrapping up and we're soon to be uh, providing that report to Ecology in the hopes that we can get that modified vegetated filter strip added to our highway runoff manual as another <coughs> tool that we can use to help treat stormwater along the roadways. Uh, we also have a facility DMP effectiveness monitoring study that's going on, and that's looking at compost amended biofiltration swales at three maintenance facilities. One is in Olympia, one is in Lakewood, and one is in Spokane. And what we're trying to do with this study is show that adding compost to a bioswale slows the water down and can achieve, can achieve treatment goals, so removal of pollutants um, in a shorter length. So a lot of times we don't have a lot of space, and if we can get best management practices that can fit into smaller areas, we'll have a lot more opportunity to build those. So we're looking at how well does a 100 foot compost emitted biofiltration swale do at removing pollutants and we have sampling locations um, a third of the way down, halfway down, two thirds, and then at the outflow. So kind of looking at the difference and where that um, pollutant removal kind of plateaus. We've also got a roadside embankment study, which we're characterizing infiltration and hydrologic treatment that occurs along roadway embankments. So just your normal embankment that's vegetated on the side of the road actually removes pollutants and water infiltrates through it. And so we're trying to quantify what's actually happening out there. Yes. Um, so, in addition to those monitoring studies, we pay into the status and trends that Abby had mentioned earlier, and then we are also funding the University of Washington and Washington State University in doing some research to evaluate the effectiveness of our compost amended biofiltration swales at reducing or eliminating that toxicity that Abby had mentioned on coho, and they're looking specifically at zebrafish. Um, report is supposed to be out in June this year on that work. And there's a YouTube video that WSU Stormwater Center put together describing that study and, and uh, what, they're, what they're doing. So I was asked to include some information on the state or <coughs> statewide what's WashDOT doing, but then also Thurston County. So um, I had mentioned that one of our facility uh, BMP effectiveness studies is in Thurston County and it is right here. Um, so that is our Motman maintenance facility and we have a compost emitted biofiltration swale there, which is right next to our office. So that is actually very efficient. Um, we also have 31 priority retrofit locations within Thurston County. So 28 of those being high retrofit locations. I did not have a chance to go through and figure out where they fit on our list of actual projects, but um, that's a pretty high number in, in the county, so I would expect that there will be some stormwater retrofit, um, standalone I-4 stormwater retrofits in this area. Um, please feel free to reach out and contact me if you want more information on that. We have four TMDLs with assigned actions for WashDOT. Uh, within Thurston County, the Deschutes TMDL, Henderson Inlet TMDL, Nisqually TMDL, and Totten L and Skookum Inlet TMDL. And then when it comes to mapping information, I pulled together what we had 
um, direct discharges to, I guess Deschutes is more this way, so Capitol Lake, this is I-5. Um, we've got several discharges with the green dots there. Um, we have six direct discharges to Capitol Lake. Two of them received some form of treatment, uh, flow control, four discharges are untreated. And then in the bottom picture here, you can see that there are 18 green dots and 11 of those discharge to tributaries that get to the lake. Four of those receive some form of treatment or flow control, seven of them discharge untreated, and then seven connect to another municipality's MS4, which eventually discharge to the lake. Um, I, yes, I will wrap. I'm gonna skip this, even though this is all of our, or a lot of our accomplishments, but I'll just, <laughs> Zoom past that and efficiencies to get to how you can get involved. So we have a stormwater retrofit management plan that is going to be um, rewritten essentially and we will be providing it to the Department of Ecology October 31st and we will be making it available for public input probably mid-September to mid-October. So. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. I think we're probably gonna do some sort of a washed out listserv <coughs> on stormwater to get the word out that folks can provide some input. This plan defines our process and our program for implementing the permit requirements. So that, can, that would be a good opportunity to participate. The other item is this community planning portal um, that I have up here and this takes you to maps of washed dots corridors and it can provide some information on what we're doing in certain areas and good contact information for who you can uh, reach out to to get more information on certain projects that are coming or generally um, find out more about a specific corridor or location. <coughs> so any additional information from us, please feel free to reach out to myself or Sheena Pietzel, who is our and PES Municipal Permit Coordinator. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really particularly appreciate your showing uh, what's going on right here in our local area with the uh, both treated and untreated uh, stormwater going into the chutes, and we'll look forward to seeing what's going on with your maintenance facility. So thank you. Uh, so uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Art Starry, who I've known for years and years. Who he's been with the county for a long time. He's a director of environmental health and very well informed on all matters relating to environmental health. Art, we're glad you're here tonight. Thank you. So thank you again. Oh, thank you for allowing me to come here tonight. And what I did, of course, being the, the good county employee that I am, I kind of reinterpreted the mission a little bit because if you look at our website and you look at my rules and the things that you see. We really don't do that sort of stormwater stuff that they talked about. We don't do facilities and things. But if you look at in terms of what, what we are responsible for as far as trying to protect the health of the community, a lot of it is directly influenced by runoff and nonpoint pollution and stuff. Whenever when rain falls from the sky and when we use it, use the water, um, that, that is a lot of what we do. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and why it's important um, and address some of the questions that were mentioned here, although um, I I didn't get into a lot of those in, in specific detail. And before I get too further along, I will push the, the, the button here so I have a timer to keep track of myself from going too far. Um, so, you know, the thing is, where's the water? And I wanted to talk, show a few of the, some pictures that talk about some of the things, or show some of the things that we do. Um, you know, everything from dealing with shellfish to drinking water to, you know, trying to protect surface waters and swimming beaches and lakes. Uh, we all respond to things like, uh, non-point pollution complaints, animal complaints, and the like. And we also have a lot to do with trying to provide information to people so that they can make the best choices about how they uh, manage properties, and manage whether they use pesticides or how they pick the best ones. So I'll talk about those in more detail, but those are some of the great pictures that I managed to steal from other presentations. Um, so you might want to ask, why do, why do we care about all this? Um, we have vulnerable aquifers. If you look at this map, it shows what are the critical aquifers in Thurston County. And if you look at the dark purple and kind of the medium purple areas, you know, those are areas that 
are called category one or category two critical aquifer recharge areas. So that means that they're very vulnerable to contamination. Largely, if we put something on the surface of the ground and the rain hits it, it's going to go down, it's going to end up in the aquifer, or it might move, it, move laterally into the surface waters that we have. And so you'll see that Thurston County is pretty darn vulnerable. And a lot of the areas um, you'll see later on where we have those, those dark purple zones and the medium purple zones are also where we have people. That's a preview. Um, and well locations. We have wells everywhere. Again, they seem to be in the same spots where the vulnerable aquifers are, which makes a lot of sense because that's where the water is. And so people would put their wells where, the, where things are. The dark spots are the community water supplies. The, the light blue spots are single family wells. And, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. We don't have enough dots, but it looks pretty diseased. And you can kind of get the picture that, again, we, have, we rely extensively on, on groundwater for our water supply in Thurston County. Uh, the possible exception that is Summit Lake, which it has its own problems because it's a, a surface water source and um, it has algae blooms. Um, so why again do we care about all this stormwater stuff? I will. I, I found another slide that we have. We have lots of stormwater facilities in Catch Basin. And here's some material that I managed to pull from our county GIS site uh, that shows them. And I don't. What each of the dots represent doesn't make so much difference as it shows that we have a lot of stormwater facilities and a lot of infiltration basins and catch basins throughout the county. And then if you look at the blue zones, you see we have, for a surprise, uh, the things that we really like about the county and what makes, us, uh, makes it a good place to live is that we have lots of surface water recreation, we have lots of facilities, and you'll see that, again, the, the stormwater and streams and the vulnerable aquifers and things all seem to be kind of in the same spot because that's where the people are. And so I think it warrants special attention and um, how we can go about trying to manage things or help people make the best choices that they can to protect our valuable water resources and to minimize pollution. Because as folks indicated before, the stormwater folks, um, we, we actually have pretty good programs to help people as they develop new stuff, but we also have to make sure that the old facilities are being managed properly and provide the best information to folks who are here. So there's another one. And we have about, just for fun, we have about 53,000 septic systems in Thurston County, and that we think they generate about 12 million gallons of wastewater per day or, or, or effluent. That's about the same amount as that big facility just down the street. It generates somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 million gallons per day. Again, what's kind of curious about this to me is you look at the green dots, you look at the wells, you look at the stormwater facilities, you look at the critical aquifer recharge areas, they all seem to be in a lot of the same spots. So that's, I think, a reason for concern and a reason why um, we need to be careful and cautious about what we're doing and why I'm, I'm happy to, that people like you are interested in this sort of issue. Uh, one thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about, though, is what guides my life um, in environmental health. Most of our programs are regulatory based, or at least there's a state law that tells us something about it. And the reason I put this up here is that most of our stuff is based on public health protection, meaning people. And so if you look, there's several state laws that talk about this, but um, it talks about the powers and duties of the local board of health, and it talks about supervision of all matters containing to people, pertaining to people. And so sometimes we get, in, I won't say cross purposes, but it, it kind of creates an, uh, a situation where when we're trying to address an issue, we may not have the rules that necessarily match as well with it. If we're talking about public health stuff, maybe we can't deal with the fish quite so much or the trees. Someone mentioned they like trees. Well, environmental health rules don't talk so much about trees because trees aren't people. Now, programs aren't completely aligned or as aligned as they could be as we move forward. So, um, and that was actually a question that I had when I was asked to speak here. Again, I don't, I'm not a stormwater person, but I am a public health person. I deal with runoff and nonpoint stuff. And so, you know, even people like me, who I, I'd like to think have been brainwashed appropriately so that we, we, we look at the bigger picture stuff, sometimes you get conflicting messages or you, you focus too narrowly on, a, on an issue. So, I just thought I'd mention that just to kind of highlight a, a problem that I think. Uh, we need to address as we're trying to, to better manage the resources and protect the environment and protect public health in Thurston County and the state of Washington. <coughs> now in environmental health we do a whole bunch of other stuff that relates to this. Uh, one of the big things we deal with is surface water monitoring and surface water programs. Here's a list of some of the different things. Uh, you know, we have ambient monitoring, meaning long-term monitoring of, of lakes and streams. Uh, we respond to algae blooms, uh, the, probably the most famous one at least in the past few years with Summit Lake a few years ago. It's a drinking water lake. Most of the people pull water from the lake without treating it. We had a toxic algae bloom that was producing a neurotoxin. Likely, you know, when you get down to what's causing the problem, why do we have neuro why do we have algae blooms with neurotoxins? It wasn't because the lake just decided to do it, it was because 
of most the nutrients and the other things that are going into the lake. And so that, again, is a runoff stormwater issue, if you want to call it that, that contributes to it. The, the bad news is we don't really know what triggers the bloom and what triggers the toxin, but certainly um, humans and stormwater and runoff and nutrients associated with that from lawns and septic systems were a contributor. Um, we work on county swimming beaches. We help the state work on, um, oh my thing is, oh there it is, I got eight minutes left. Um, shellfish biotoxin monitoring with the state, so they, they provide some funding to us so we can work, do monitoring for shellfish and help respond to, to issues like that. And again, what really causes those sorts of things? Uh, why, why do we get red tides? When did, why do they migrate south and when do they migrate south? Who knows for sure, but it's, I suspect it has something to do with the stuff that makes its way into Puget Sound that has something to do with, uh, with, with what we're doing to it. Um, we respond to spills and water quality problems. Um, we also do some groundwater monitoring, and predominantly in the south part of the county uh, and some other spots under contract with folks. And so there's a, a little bit of everything that we do to try to help deal with stuff. And again, all these different things are related to or, or have something to do with, uh, or can be influenced by surface water runoff and stormwater, those sorts of pollutant sources. So far so good? Okay. Yay. Uh, what I wanted to do, uh, talk a little bit about is some, some monitoring that we are doing. Uh, just as a highlight, it, it's, uh, and this is something, thank you Public Works for helping provide funding for this because it's through a stormwater utility, so thank you folks for paying into that. Um, and we have 38, 35 sites on 28 streams and rivers, and we do all sorts of, all eight watersheds or <coughs> subbasins. We also do 10 lakes, and the purposes of these programs are again to track things over time. Um, so once a month, uh, the lakes are typically done, or, or done during the, the warmer part of the year, uh, the, the streams are done year-round, but those are to try to track trends over time to see whether or not uh, our programs, whether they're stormwater or, or uh, land or septic systems or whatever, are being effective, and try to give us an idea if, if there are problems coming up. Uh, they aren't intended to identify specific sources of pollution. Again, it's, they're typically at the mouths of the stream or in the middle of the lake. So they, they have a specific purpose, and we're very fortunate in that we've been able to do that. So with, uh, you can thank uh, our, our commissioners and other folks for supporting those programs over time because we have a really good data set. Oops, and there's, there's someone doing some monitoring. And these are the different sites that we have. And the colored pins have to do with which watershed they're in. So the yellow ones are the Deschutes, and the, the, the red ones are the kind of the Indian Moxley, you know, downtown area. The, those kind of weird pinkish ones are up in Henderson. So I won't go into more details, but that just shows the different sites that we have. <coughs> and people, one of the questions was, where can people get the data? Well, we have a report that we do every year, um, and it talks about water quality in the different watersheds. Um, I won't, if there's a handout over there that shows you where you can find that online if you'd like to see it, or to see the data just itself without reading the whole report. So it's a pretty neat thing. Again, I think it's, it's very good work. and and. Actually, having this sort of information has been helpful. Um, I guess one of the, I have to brag a little bit about Henderson Inlet. Um, water quality there has generally improved for the past several years, uh, resulting in the upgrade of several, several acres of about 330 net gain of commercial shellfish harvesting areas. And because the county has data and the cities have good data on the stuff, the Department of Ecology was actually to be able to evaluate that and do something called an effectiveness report on um, actions out there. And they found it's one of the few areas where they can document the, the stuff that the area residents, whether and the cities and the county and other, other interested parties were able to do actually improve the water quality or they could show a, a definite correlation to that. And that's because we have good data. So, um, so thank you. Um, and I can send you a link to that, but I, in my hurried way, I didn't put that in the presentation. Um, so there's a lot of more stuff that we do. We do septic system permitting and complaints. Um, again, uh, land use reviews. Uh, there's one there that I think we've been asked to take a look at that has to do with the, the City of Olympia project. We do that both for the county and we provide comments on city things. Uh, septic system monitoring and maintenance, and that's been a big part of my life. And I wish I could make another, make it into someone else's life, but it's been mine. Um, solid waste permitting. Uh, state law says that we get to, to deal with solid waste complaints. Uh, and permit the facility. So there's about 17 solid waste facilities in Thurston County and the health department gets to permit them. Uh, solid and hazardous waste complaints and investigations. Uh, and we've worked uh, quite a bit with our folks in the stormwater program, especially the county stormwater 
program to, uh, to respond to complaints and try to identify the source of those, whether they're a violation, and then to work with the property owners to, to achieve compliance. And so that is a, a neat collaborative program that we have. Uh, animal waste complaints, that's why I put a picture of the cows there. Um, Thurston County is unique in that we have something called the Nonpoint Pollution Ordinance. Uh, that kind of helps fill in the gaps between the state and the, and the, the county and Department of Ag and, and other things. So we are, I think, probably the first one to have done that. We're, there was just a few of them that actually have. So it's a pretty neat, pretty neat, pretty neat thing. We deal with small public water supplies, uh, water system technical assistance, and a, the county, county integrated pest management policy. Thurston County was one of the first to actually have an extensive program that makes sure that the county properties are managed using something called integrated pest management methods to try to make sure that we make use the least toxic alternatives when we manage county properties. And part of that has been a review of pesticides to find out whether or not they are potential carcinogens or, um, anyways, I can't remember all the, the terminology, but it's, it's a pretty land, I mean, pretty significant thing. And so if you were to go to that Grow Smart, Grow Safe site, that's something the county now runs, and it shows actually the results of those reviews. We first started doing that just for county, but then there's such interest in it that we worked with other folks to actually have our results reviewed and confirmed, and now we make that information available to the public online. And so, so there's a bookmark over there with Grow Smart, Grow Safe on it if you want to look at that. So with that, I'm just gonna say thank you. There's a lot more that I could talk about in, in 15 minutes, or actually, I can say only 13. Um, um, I could go into more details, but it would be really, really hard. And so I think what I'll do is leave things for questions, and just uh, thank you for being here. All right, thank you for such a wonderful overview of so many things you do, and it's really nice to know we're a leader among all the counties in the state on some of these uh, aspects of looking at our environment and our water. So, uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Wilkie. He's the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Puget Sound Keepers. And we're very happy to welcome you. Thank you for coming tonight. Hey, we did it. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Wilkie. I'm your Puget Sound Keeper, and I'm really happy to be here. And I am actually thrilled that there's a room full of people that came to a meeting on stormwater. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> and we're really driving it, diving into the details. We're not just saying, yes, you need to pick up your dog poop and fix the oil, oily leak on your car, um, water less. Those are all important things, but we're not going to get to the solution just by doing those things. So we, we really do need institutional <laughs> solutions to this problem. Um, I'm going to start off and just tell you a little bit about my organization and I'm going to try and go fast through this presentation because I think it's a, it's a little long for the time that's allotted. So um, I may be flying through some of the slides. My organization, Puget Soundkeeper, was founded in 1984. We were the first citizen groups to focus on the health of the waters of Puget Sound. We were originally called the, um, the Puget Sound Alliance at that time. And our first action was to focus on uh, improving sewage treatment infrastructure. And we were looking at the West Point uh, sewage treatment plant in, um, in Seattle. And the proposal at the time was to only do primary treatment at that uh, facility. And if you are aware of what primary treatment is, it's loosely uh, equivalent to screening out the floaters. Uh, so it's not ad adequate for a city of a half million people. Uh, but we were successful in getting secondary treatment installed there, and it's been treating the waters mostly ever since, except for an episode, uh, was it last year or the year before? I think it was the year before, uh, where it was down for a few weeks, and we were um, uh, discharging partially treated uh, sewage and for a few hours untreated sewage into Puget Sound. Uh, in 1990, we joined uh, a movement called the Waterkeeper Movement. At, um, at that time, it was just six organizations. Uh, now there's 340 around the world. Uh, we all have the word keeper in our name. We all have uh, a boat that we operate to patrol our waterways. We're accountable to our communities, and we stand up for the enforcement of environmental regulations. Um, and some of us even have matching tattoos. Um, <laughs> we operate a pollution hotline, 1-800-42-PUGIT. Um, that you can, uh, I received two calls today on that. We will look into issues and get back to you. Um, we conduct monitoring and enforcement of our waterways, so our regular waterway patrols. 
Um, this is a scrap metal facility in Seattle. You want to talk about swimmable waters? That's our staff attorney there in the green cap, swimming in the waters of the Duwamish River right in front of Seattle Iron and Metals. We just settled a Clean Water Act case with that facility uh, a couple months ago. Uh, they are installing upgraded treatment. Um, we also do education and stewardship. Uh, we're cleaning our water. We did 81 cleanups last year, uh, a number of educational presentations, um, and removing over 13,000 pounds of uh, debris from our waters last year, most of it lightweight plastic. Um, and then we're also involved in policy and engagement um, issues. We are working to improve regulations uh, in Olympia through the legislature and also through the, uh, the administrative rulemaking practice. Um, pro uh, process, including the stormwater permits that you heard about earlier. And a lot of that comes uh, from the actions of citizens. So why are we here tonight? Why are we talking about stormwater permits? Well, we're talking about stormwater permits because about how many years ago is this now? 49 years ago, a bunch of people came together and decided they would plan some demonstrations. Uh, it started on college campuses. It was initially planned in Seattle. It spread across the country. It was called Earth Day 1970. And it was still the largest demonstration in our nation's history. Uh, 20 million people took to the streets that day uh, to protest the rivers that were catching on fire and the oil spills and the um, sewage problems that people had in their community. Within three years, we got the EPA, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, um, and uh, we were well on our way to starting to improve our environment, and it's because people spoke up. Um, so uh, we're here today to talk about stormwater. Um, that's a famous picture I'm proud to have taken on the Duwamish River. Um, that's an outfall from um, Boeing Field, King County International Airport, uh, into the Duwamish River. It never fails to impress. Um, but it's extra impressive when there's a heron sitting there. Um, so stormwater is, the, uh, is what flows off of our, um, our streets, roads, uh, highways, rooftops, and industrial sites. We'll have more on that later. This, this slide uh, messed up a little bit. Um, started off, we were forested, uh, and then we developed this area, and that's really the source of our problem, is all the pavement um, that is here. Uh, so, uh, stormwater is a, a water pollution problem. It's also a water quantity problem. We get too much uh, force coming down those uh, storm drains, scouring out our creeks. And it's even a solid waste problem because you can also have cigarette butts and bottle caps and um, little shards of plastic. I was on the kayak on Sunday cleaning Lake Union and we had these little trout nets and we were just cleaning plastic off the surface all morning long. It was just um, never ending. Um, so it's also a source of uh, plastic debris. Um, but it definitely is impacting our fish. It's the number one source of toxic pollution to Puget Sound. It can be kind of hard to predict where the toxic is going to, uh, toxic um, impacts are going to occur, where and when. It's very uh, spiky. Um, but one thing I would like to share with you, and this is the number one reason why I'm glad I got my presentation to play. Um, this is a coho salmon. Uh, in the Duwamish River. Now a lot of times we think, we've heard about the urban runoff mortality sy syndrome impacting uh, small creeks. This is in a big waterway uh, in downtown Seattle. This is a uh, bright ocean fish that was um, just maybe hours coming back from um, the ocean in Puget Sound. Oops, did we go back here? Let's see. So these fish, they enter the fresh water and they come into contact with stormwater for the first time and they are losing their ability to process oxygen in their, in their cells. So you literally have a fish in water that has plenty of oxygen in it suffocating. It's very similar effect to cyanide. Um, that was a picture taken by some volunteers of ours um, while we were doing a beach cleanup. Uh, we weren't even there to monitor for the effects of urban runoff mortality syndrome. In urban creeks, this, the mortality rate can be as high as 80 or 90% some years. Why do we still have fish in those creeks? It's 
good question. It's mainly because they're close to a larger river and we have strays that are, are coming up those creeks because the self-sustaining um, population has been killed. Um, there are many impacts of stormwater, uh, many different chemicals that uh, come into play. Um, uh, temperature is even one of them, also flow as we talked about earlier. Um, what we're going to talk about are the different types, different categories of stormwater. Almost always when I hear people talking about stormwater, they're talking about it in the context of um, municipal stormwater, which is the road, that's the stuff that we see most readily. Uh, and that's what comes off our roads, rooftops, um, parking lots, and highways. Um, and it can be uh, pretty devastating. It certainly covers the largest area. Uh, and it also contain other uh, sort of non-stormwater pollutants. The picture on the left, someone was cleaning their paintbrushes. Uh, they were painting a facility in Fremont, in Seattle, and they thought it would be really good to just dump that uh, paint out in the, um, in the street. And uh, one of the things that uh, municipalities are required to have is they're required to have a hotline and a response uh, when there are complaints. And that little trickle made it this far from the storm drain, when the guy from Seattle Public Utilities showed up, he factored the whole street, sealed off that storm drain, and checked the next one down to make sure it wasn't going. So that paint did not, and then he went to talk to the guy who was actually painting. <laughs> but he stopped the pollution that day, and that was all because of uh, someone had the wherewithal uh, to um, snap a photo and call it in. That was the first uh, iPhone picture I ever, ever had emailed to me. I was, uh, I was working with some volunteers that day. Um, but that's just one type of stormwater. The other things that we deal with are industrial stormwater. Um, those are metal shavings that you see there. Uh, that's a uh, galvanizing plant, uh, Tacoma Metals, or a recycling uh, and galvanizing area. Um, and they're subject to an NPDES permit. And believe it or not, they're actually held to higher standards than the cities and counties. They actually have to meet water quality standards. Um, and uh, the reason why cities and counties and the highway system don't have to meet water quality standards is because um, the U.S. Congress, in all their wisdom, uh, as soon as there was a court case that uh, proved that stormwater was a point source and we had to begin regulating it, the U.S. Congress moved to exempt cities and counties from having to hit the numeric standards to protect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our waterways. That's what the Clean Water Act uh, promised when it was passed in 1972. It will uh, protect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the waters as a national goal to st uh, stop the pollution, uh, discharge of pollutants to navigable waters by 1985. Um, so we still have a ways to go to hit that goal. Um, but through these permits is one of the ways that we have to do that. That facility is now operating a stormwater treatment system um, to uh, take those heavy metals out of their stormwater. Um, two other uh, sources, another one is construction stormwater, uh, mobilizing a lot of sediment and, and mud, uh, getting into the water can choke a, choke a stream, uh, and then also agricultural stormwater. Here's another big, huge exemption. Uh, you were saying you were filling a gap between federal and state authorities. That is a giant gap uh, in agricultural stormwater. So thank you for what you're doing there. Um, that's the largest source of water pollution nationwide. Um, so what can we do? Oh, there's that pipe again. Sorry. Um, what can we do um, about stormwater? Well, the first thing we need to do, we need to realize it's very expensive and complicated solutions. So it's going to involve a legal discussion because we're not just going to suddenly appropriate that money and fix this problem just because it's a good idea. Otherwise, we'd all have solar panels on our roof and we'd be driving Teslas or bicycles. Uh, but some of us are still driving uh, other things. So um, we actually have to compel um, solutions. So again, here's the, the Clean Water Act. This is a little background actually that I just covered. I forgot it was in my slides. Um, so our strategy is um, to strengthen stormwater regulations, assist um, agencies and permittees in meeting those um, obligations and then when um, when they uh, fail to meet those sometimes we have to enforce the Clean Water Act and we've done that over 170 times in our organization's history the vast majority of those have been industrial stormwater cases 
Um, but we do, we um, just recently settled a case with Snohomish County, very cooperative, they were excellent to work with. Yes, it was in the context of a lawsuit, uh, but we like to call it tough love. Um, and they were great to work with, and uh, they've since upgraded their low impact development requirements and uh, performed a million dollar uh, mitigation project uh, as a result. And we do have a case going right now with the city of Anacortes as well. Um, so we, um, getting ahead of myself. Uh, the first thing we need to do is, is strengthen the stormwater permits, and this is something that we've done a number of times over the years to look at those standards. They come out every five years. We're just almost in a finalization stage with the municipal and um, the uh, Washington State Department of Transportation permits. All the comments are in. Um, it's still time for the agency uh, to strengthen those. Uh, we would love to see a response to, to urban runoff mortality syndrome. Uh, when you know coho salmon are dying in those creeks, we would like to see uh, a response plan developed and having that required by the permit. That's something that we put into our comments. Um, in the industrial um, um, series of permits, um, there are standards that need to be approved. The boatyard permit is especially lenient on terms of the numeric standards, so there's opportunity to strengthen that. Um, so typically we are, um, we start by attending the stakeholder meetings um, and uh, we review the draft permits when they come out. We write uh, detailed comments. Uh, sometimes it gets wrapped up in the legislature, uh, but, or there's the rulemaking process where the public can comment. And then at the end of the day, if the permit comes out and it's finalized and we don't think it complies with state law or federal law, we can appeal that permit. And between 2000 and 2010, we appealed every general permit that was issued by Washington Department of Ecology, uh, and we got improvements in all of these permits. Um, and now we're focusing on implementation for the most part. Um, so with municipal stormwater, as was uh, one of the, um, Abby, I think, spoke of, it really focuses on those tasks that you do because you don't have um, that numeric standard that you have to hit. But public education, uh, looking for, um, uh, stormwater management and things like that to uh, reduce the impacts is really important. Um, what we won in our appeal in 2009, however, was a requirement for post-construction stormwater control. So when um, we develop um, properties um, with, for new development and redevelopment, it's now um, the, the policy in the state of Washington that you have to implement low impact development, green stormwater infrastructure to the maximum extent um, practicable. Um, so that green infrastructure becomes the preferred and commonly used method for site development. Um, I'm going to skip uh, industrial stormwater because I think we're running out of time here. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, industrial stormwater, if they don't hit their numbers, uh, they eventually have to s install an on-site treatment system so that they, they reach their numbers. Uh, there are some of the uh, appeals um, that we've been successful in strengthening um, the, uh, stormwater permits. Uh, we're also looking for new technologies uh, that will uh, treat stormwater to a higher standard, and identify those, and try to get those uh, written into the permit for the next round, and that's something that we are very successful on with uh, industrial stormwater. Um, I, I believe we have a special opportunity in 2019, um, and I think we're well on our way to achieving some of these um, uh, improvements. Um, as we mentioned, we have the municipal stormwater permit, the Washington State Department of Transportation permit. We have an opportunity to strengthen those, and we have a set of recommendations that's coming out of Governor Inslee's Orca Recovery Task Force that basically says we need to do more. We need to protect our salmon. Uh, we need to remove those toxic pollutants. Uh, from the stormwater. It's not just a salmon and orca issue, however, it is also a human health issue. Um, do we have any salmon fishers in this room? A few. Um, do, do you know that, uh, according to the Department of Health guidelines, that we should not eat more than one Chinook salmon out of Puget Sound every year? Um, there's, uh, the guideline is two meals a month, and I, if you do the math, um, that's about a pound a month, two eight ounce meals. If you got a 12 pound fish, that's what they give us a punch card with 20 punches on it, but the Department of Health says we shouldn't uh, eat more than one fish a year uh, due to PCBs. 
Uh, and some of those are coming from um, legacy sites, like we have super fun sites like on the Duwamish River and, uh, and here in Olympia Flood Inlet. Uh, but all of it, a lot of it's coming right in through um, through stormwater. Um, all right, at the for my last bit here, I want to talk a little bit about our municipal stormwater accountability project. Um, this was something that was improved as a near-term action by the Puget Sound Partnership. However, it was not funded, um, so we did it anyway. Um, and uh, what we did is we reviewed, we worked with Washington Environmental Council, our partners on this, and we reviewed those um, mandatory upgrades on the um, low-impact development requirements, the green infrastructure for new and redevelopment. And um, in case you were wondering, there are 83 municipalities in the Puget Sound area. Uh, we counted them, and we contacted every one of them. And we did a project uh, where we checked up on them to see how they were doing, to see were they implementing Ecology's permit. Um, the short story is about half of them were. Uh, initially, when we started the project, it was a lot lower than that, but we worked with some of them to upgrade their codes so that uh, the development that was occurring was meeting these standards. And uh, we looked at a number of things, and I brought with me um, some handouts for you all. And uh, maybe you can help pass these out. Should be enough. Um, so we called the, the project Nature Scorecard, and uh, we reviewed the building codes, and we looked for those post-construction stormwater controls, and also uh, specific uh, construction requirements, what was happening during construction, what was it supposed to look like afterwards. And uh, you see our little graph there in the lower left. The, the green bar is the 47% of municipalities that were um, meeting the permit uh, a year after the deadline. Um, and then the other 53% had a ways to go. Uh, uh, your municipality and see how, uh, see how they're doing. Um, this, this, this is not comprehensive on everything stormwater. This is just for uh, these new green infrastructure controls, which were brand new in the last permit. Uh, the, the decision came down in 2009. Um, the, we had a fight in the legislature, but the permit a requirement um, was in 2016. Um, to get all those in place, and we still have a ways to go. And um, for my uh, last couple slides here, I just wanted to, one thing is recognize the municipalities that were going above and beyond. We actually had uh, Green Star Awards, uh, and I think we have Lacey on there, and Olympia, uh, that went above and beyond. So uh, thank you for your leadership. It is going to take uh, that proactive push on one end, but it's also a compliance push on the other end. So I would encourage um, everyone to go to the website, Nature's Scorecard, oh, I'm embarrassed now, it's .org or .com. It's probably on your, your handout. Um, you can learn more about that. And if you're interested in getting involved with Puget Soundkeeper, um, I did bring some brochures, which I'll have up at the table here. Um, you can become a member, you can learn to um, how to get involved in our work, um, show up at one of our cleanup events, something like that. So, anyway, thanks for this opportunity. I'll be happy to answer questions. So I'm going to take a five minute break. So, we'll come back in five minutes and we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. Thank you.
So, um, well, through through ecology, we have limited authority in being able to require all mon all outfalls to be monitored. And um, so, of the outfalls that we do have authority on, there are some outfalls that are required to be monitored for specific facilities to make sure that they're meeting their benchmarks, um, which are required under the permit. Um, and as far as the municipal stormwater permit goes, we've moved towards this regional monitoring program. Um, but there are um, local programs still in place, like the county operates, that are looking at more outfalls than are being done. So it's, it's mainly, a, for ecology, it's a limited amount of authority that we, we can um, use to, to make those requirements. I don't know if you have anything you want to add. I'm just going to go ahead and say cost. Um, it is very expensive to collect scientifically credible, legally defensible data, and um, logistically to collect samples. You know, stormwater when it rains, you got to go and collect your sample. And with our municipal permit, we have very strict um, criteria as to when we collect those samples. It needs to be after a antecedent dry period. Um, it needs to be 75% of the storm event needs to be pulled from um, from the location you're sampling. So we don't take grab samples. We actually have stations with tubes that suck water, aliquots of water every so often based on the amount of rain that we're expecting to get in a given storm. So, and that ensures that you're getting a representative sample of that storm event. So you're not just taking one sample out of it and saying this is representative of the whole event. And so, um, in order to do that and to implement that sort of a monitoring program, um, I think our, we spend about $2 million a biennium just on monitoring. <laughs> Um, and those monitoring requirements that are defined in our municipal permit. So, I, we would not be able to monitor all of our outfalls. And honestly, um, you know, I would, I would rather put that money, money towards building something that's going to actually treat the water. I feel like there's a certain point where you kind of have an idea of what's in the water, now let's build the things that are going to, to fix it or to help fix it. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, who decides how much money is available for stormwater monitoring for the department? Is it the legislature and some kind of line item, or is it the department making an administrative decision once they get an appropriation from the legislature? So we get our funding through the legislature, and um, in 2009 I mentioned that our municipal permit requirements elevated significantly and we went to the legislature at that time and said in order to comply with our municipal permit and these increased requirements we're going to need a certain amount of funding and they have continued to fund us at that level since that time um, so the money is essentially set aside for stormwater and and by, the legislature. by the legislature yeah so there would be a citizen action lobby the legislature for more than $2 million a year for stormwater monitoring. And their budget is how many billion? <laughs> so, uh, okay, how about another question? How about over here? As someone who owns um, a number of houses in a residential development, we collect all the water that's in there and it goes over across the way to a big holding pond. Is there a way, or is there somewhere you could direct me to where we could enhance that um, biofiltration to reduce any of the loads of toxins or whatever that we should be addressing in that? Oh, so who's, who takes that one part? Is that we, you? We have a, a volunteer in the corner. <laughs> oh, okay. Here, could you introduce yourself? Oh, right. You have the answer to that question? Oh, could you introduce yourself? Well. <laughs> My name is Anne Marie Pierce and I work for Thurston County. I'm in the, we just went through a reorganization. So I'm in community planning and economic development in water planning and we receive a significant amount of our funding from stormwater fees. So that's why I know a little bit about stormwater. Um, and so your question, I think in your neighborhood, 
you might have something like what's called, we would call a stormwater pond. So the, the water, the stormwater runoff is being collected through grassy swales, ditches, pipes, or something like that, and it's going into a stormwater pond um, that was designed, is that what you're talking about, or is it a, 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 a natural pond? So we, we, no, it's not a natural pond, it's probably about as big as this room, mm -hmm. and it collects everything from the road, the roofs, everything. Okay, so it's a big so, retention basin. My assumption is that that was a design, engineered, constructed stormwater pond, which is a stormwater facility, um, and those are specifically designed by engineers um, to, you know, be able to handle a certain amount of stormwater runoff, and in some cases also um, do some kinds of um, pollutant removal or infiltration. So I would recommend, if you're interested in doing any kind of enhancements, and it's in your neighborhood, and it, contacting your local stormwater program. So like either the city of Olympia, I don't know if you're in Olympia, Lacey or Tom, why you could contact the Water Resources Stormwater Program to find out um, if you're able to make improvements. Um, my understanding would be that all things would have to be designed by a stormwater engineer and approved through your jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Oh, but I do wanna, I do wanna this make a little plug. Um, <laughs> Thurston County, oh, excuse me, Thurston County and the cities of Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater are, we've partnered the last few years, and we are again this year, this spring, to host a free workshop for citizens and neighborhoods and HOAs to learn about how to properly inspect and maintain your neighborhood stormwater facilities. And we have flyers over here on this table. Our workshop is coming up this coming Saturday and will be held up at South Puget Sound um, Community College. And the workshop starts, I think it's, 8.30, um, if you'd like additional information, you can come get this flyer or ask any of us at our table. Um, is it the main campus? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Wilkie, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding the, uh, the stormwater facility, I think that represents sort of an intermediate type of uh, management that we have used. It used to be uh, stormwater, used to be managed through ditches. And uh, that wasn't actually the worst kind of thing, but then we eventually started to build pipes. And uh, with pipes came really, really efficient about getting that stormwater away from the developed land and into the nearest creek, and those caused a lot of problems with that gusher effect. Uh, and so starting in the 1990s, they started to have a flow control requirement. And what I'm guessing what you have there is a detention facility that it grabs the water that's coming down, give that flash of water, goes into the pond, and then it's slowly meted out after that. There's some pollutant removal, as um, the woman said, but they're really not a treatment facility per se. Um, and then the modern way of doing it is actually getting closest back to Mother Nature, which is the green infrastructure, which is treating the stormwater on the actual site, on each plot of land where it comes off the roof and into a rain garden or a bioretention facility or even having a pavement that allows the rainwater to soak right through it. Um, and that is what's built into the permits now for new development and redevelopment. But we have a lot of existing uh, development that's out there. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Up back here. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then after you, you the woman, and a couple. Next Hi, one I'd back. like to ask Art. Um, does uh, the county health services do they, do they um, encourage, discourage, prohibit the use of rain barrels on site water usage, gray water reuse? Uh, so as far as rain barrels and things, those are, from my perspective, that's perfectly fine. Um, and so if you want to collect your rainwater and use it for gardening or other purposes, that's a, a great thing if you can manage it. Um, there are, uh, right now the county doesn't have a real active gray water reuse program. The state, state does have a, a permitting requirement, so if you have a home that uh, and you want to separate gray water out from black water, in other words, the stuff from your sink and laundry, and, and manage that separately, there's a permitting requirement that has to go through the county to do it. And right now, the way the, the rules are set up is it's a seasonal thing, so you would be doing it during the driest portion of the year. But that's something that 
that, that's possible. Uh, again, we, we don't have a real active program. I can't recall actually reviewing a permit for one. Not that I would do it, but our staff having done it. But it's something that's a possibility. So, sorry if you already answered this, but um, what is the, we just purchased a place that has the, a wetland on our property, and we're in the city of Olympia, and there's residential development around that's somewhat recent, but has no um, runoff control. And so there is oil and contaminants of all sorts going into this wetland. And I'm just wondering, is there a time period cut off for these, what is it for the um, new requirements that can be addressed differently? Who wants to take that one? Um, so as far as the municipal stormwater permits, which is what regulates new and redevelopment in the cities and the counties, um, and in, are you in the Olympia? Or, yeah, so um, in 2007 is when the phase two permits were first issued to the small counties or cities. And then um, the actual requirements to start implementing the new and redevelopment standards, they weren't required to be implemented until 2010. So it was really starting in 2007 that projects are starting to, in the smaller urbanized areas, starting to have stormwater controls be required. And then as Chris said, it wasn't, it's not until, or it wasn't until 2016 where cities and counties were required to implement low impact development as a preferred and commonly used approach. Yeah, so again, it's that, um, if that was an industrial site discharging to that wetland, it would be a, a violation of the Clean Water Act. Um, but because municipalities don't have to hit the parts per million of the different pollutants, uh, they instead have a management plan, management approach that they have to follow. So as long as they are doing the storm drain cleaning and the operation and maintenance and the public education and all the other steps, um, they are in compliance. Um, and we really will get towards changing the way we manage the storm water through voluntary retrofits, so uh, you know, appropriating the money, ripping up the pavement, putting in green infrastructure voluntarily, and through the site redevelopment process. So when when a site gets torn down or a new area gets developed, it has to meet those higher standards. But that applies to the water heating, uh, heat, heat sound, but inlet or individual little wetlands. Proportionately, percentage-wise, far more impacted than yeah. a larger body of water. Well, um, I'm I'm really excited by your last comment. I hope that you'll write the Trump administration and tell them not to exempt wetlands from the Clean Water Act, which is what they're trying to do right now. Uh, so um, you can get involved in that. It's called Waters of the U.S. and you can tell them um, how important uh, before April 15 how important wetlands are. Um, if that wetland is connected through flowing water or hydrologically connected, as the law sits right now, it is considered a water of the U.S. and it is um, has the same protections that navigable waters have. Um, if it is completely isolated, which is almost impossible, uh, then then it might be exempt. But um, it is it is a public waterway. It's owned by by all of us. So that but the. If the question is how do we fix the problem, how do we stop the pollutants from going in there, we have a voluntary approach where we can uh, appropriate the money and, and fix the infrastructure, or we can gradually you know, start building our, our land uh, differently so that we treat stormwater on site. Okay, another question, how about in the back here? Yeah, so, you know, Washington State's growing fast. I don't really need it. Um, Washington State's growing fast, and you know we are getting more impervious surfaces, and, and including right here in Olympia, we have this uh, missing middle controversy policy that's probably going to increase rural development, and we are seeing it now in Tumwater, where they're building right down to the lakes and uh, uh, impacting wetland hydrology. And but this is allowed, and as long as this is allowed, I don't. It, it's hard to see how we're going to really 
turn the corner on stormwater management. At that best, we might have a red queen of just running to, running, running to stand still, basically. But are we actually going to make progress while we're still developing as a state, one of the fastest growing in the nation? I could say the county's reviewing the SMP right now, which includes buffers uh, uh, zones for shorelines. So that might be something the public input to the planning commission would, would help. Yeah, this, this is uh, Phyllis Farrell. She's on the county stormwater advisory committee. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, supposedly, stormwater is the major issue of Puget Sound. Do we know, as a county, do we have any method of measuring and assessing what our contribution to that is? And it seems like if we don't know what exactly what we need to address, how can we develop the programs to really manage it? So I don't know who wants to take that. Our, how does our county compare in terms of stormwater contribution, I guess in terms of pollution, with say Mason County or Pierce County? How do we know? Well, the quickest way to know is probably calculate your impervious surfaces because there's a direct line from impervious surfaces to suffering water quality. And usually, if you have more than 10% of a landscape that's covered by impervious surfaces, the water quality is going to suffer. Uh, so that's that's um, one way um, that you can know just by counting that up. Um, and then as far as uh, making a difference, uh, we need to change those impervious surfaces. And one of the ways that we can do that is getting the legislature to appropriate more money for stormwater retrofits. It's been as high as 100 million per biennium in the past, and more recently it's been around 28 million. Um, and um, you know, if we could get that number up as high as 200 million or 500 million, we could really start to, to make a difference, but it's gonna take a lot of effort um, and uh, a lot of political will uh, to change that. So speaking up in, in the budget process is one of the ways you can do that. It's called the Stormwater Financial Assistance Program. It makes grants to uh, entities to retrofit uh, infrastructure. there was very instrumental in helping organizations use uh, permeable surfaces when we built a new building, for example, the Turning Point Domestic Violence uh, Facility. We put in permeable surfaces for the parking lot and the sidewalks because we were on a stream or near a stream. I don't know if there's any effort to increase the, the um, uh, proportion of surfaces that are permeable? Does anybody know? That's exactly what that stormwater financial assistance program is designed to do. So for instance, under that, with that funding, a municipality could, uh, you know, replace all pavement in a cul-de-sac, for example, with permeable pavement, and then that would no longer be uh, adding to the runoff, it would be infiltrating into the ground. Right. It doesn't work really well in high traffic areas or with lots of trucks, it gets torn up a lot. Uh, so it tends to work better in parking lots and residential areas. Right. So the, yeah, that is what um, the municipal stormwater permits required as far as in 2016. So they asked all cities and counties <clears throat> to look at the, their full suite of development codes, not just their stormwater codes, to um, remove any barriers to low impact development. So that is permeable pavement is an example of low impact development. And, um, and to make low impact development the preferred and commonly used approach to um, new and redevelopment. So you will see over time, as our impervious services, um, our development increases in this area um, because of the new population, cities and counties will be employing those new codes to um, require low impact development at these new and redevelopment sites. So we know that these BMPs are effective at treating and and, and slowing down low impact development on the site and subdivision scale. It's just we already have all of this development that's occurred that we need to address. And, and that's, our, that's a big effort. Well, 
So you mentioned before, I think Harvard Ecology was at the SAM program or the water block. So there's different water quality efforts that are out there to try to evaluate how things are being changed over time. And, and that ambient program that I mentioned for Thurston County, while it doesn't have all the parameters that are affected by stormwater, it does track those things. So there's some nutrients and other things that in fecal coliform that we track. So that gives us some indications whether things are getting better or worse, and, and maybe we can then relate that to different land use activities. And there have been things in the past where um, actually monitoring like that or the TMDL work that, that people have probably heard about total maximum daily load studies and things have identified uh, segments and streams or areas that have been problems. And there have been improvements. I was bragging a bit about Henderson Inlet, but one of the big contributors to those improvements was work to bet that our, city of Lit our deputy mayor of Lacey is here, but a lot of the stormwater work that they did, they put in some huge facilities out actually towards the Department of Ecology property and others to improve water quality. And that was a significant contributor. And so there are ways to make progress, but as folks have indicated, it's a lot of money. Um, I don't know what the total bill is from City of Lacey. I know ratepayers paid some of it. I think they got grants for others, but it was truly a significant contribution. But it, it, it shows that you can make progress uh, if the community puts their, their mind or puts their uh, efforts together to try to address a concern. So that's, I guess that's the optimistic viewpoint of things, that it's not, all is not lost, there are ways to make progress, but it takes effort, combined effort, and it takes money. Well, thank you, one and all. Thank you, first of all, to our panelists. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to put together excellent presentations and taking the time to be here with us today. And thank you to so many interested people here who really make this a, a very worthwhile forum. And obviously, our heads are full here tonight, but uh, even though we've only scratched the surface. So I hope you can take all this and dig further. Uh, we'd like to invite you to come to our last forum. Yes, these will come to an end. <laughs> Uh, it's our, our last one, number five, is Tuesday, May 7th, right here, same time, same place. And the title is, Where's the Water? Streams, Salmon, and Orchids. So uh, please come, and we'll see you in a month. Thank you. Oh, please help staff. Thank you.